Welcome to Boringsville, which is what I'm calling my house now, featuring Miss Weed's Quarantine Zit. I love it here. I love living on this lady's face. I disagree. The dogs are enjoying quarantine enormously. <sighs> it's Miss Weep doesn't know anything. A little more soulful today because we're writing letters. But Miss Weep, why are we writing letters? That's boring! First of all, tiny puppet shark slash child voice person, what else do you have to do? Really, what else? Oh, we stuck here. That's a good point. Thank you, tiny shark puppet. Now go away. Also, I want letters. I'm so sick of just like texting my friends. I want something real, something I can hold in my hands, something I can cherish forever. Snapchats disappear, but a letter, you can hold it, you can hug it, you can say, hello letter, you can fold it up, you can rip it. You know, lots of things you can do with a letter. <laughs> third, third thing, <laughs> letters are really interesting. They have a super interesting history. They're a part of human communication for eons, millennia. So, Let's keep that tradition alive. You know how much I love history. You know how much I love writing. Let's combine the two. Actually, fourth reason, uh, letters can help you manage some of the woogity, stressed out, angsty, angsty feelings that you get when you're in quarantine. They really can help you navigate feeling kind of about the people or the zits that you have during this time. Finally, if you don't practice writing, love chickens, my sweet little beans, your brain is going to atrophy into a horrible juice of goo that comes out your ears. It's science. It's science. You don't even need to look it up. Just trust me, it's science. So let's get started. <laughs> It's Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, and he's being stabbed with writing utensils. Quarantine is having fun effects on my mental health. The first ever letter, according to the historian Hellenicus, uh, the first ever letter was written uh, by Persian Queen Atossa around 500 BC. I don't have the text of it here, but I have some other funny letters throughout history that I think are kind of interesting. Um, the first paper was used from the bark of the linden tree, and then Egyptians started creating papyrus, which is this crossbreed between fabric and paper, making a really stiff, awesome surface to write on. Uh, papyrus became so valuable, laws were passed, barring it leaving the country. Like it was so power, so important that it had to stay. Obviously those laws didn't really last for a long time because, you know, the whole point of a letter is to let it go. Let it go, send it to the post office. They didn't have post offices, but we'll get there. Um, eventually, uh, cotton paper was developed in around the 10th century in the West. Also in the West, in Saxon England, they used the quills of geese to write letters with. So if you see a goose wandering outside, I'll allow you to break quarantine to chase that goose down and rip its feathers out. Geese love that. Again, I will deny I said that in court. Going back to the Romans, which I think you know something about. You certainly know something about it, Julius Caesar, dead guy. <laughs> the Romans uh, had the first kind of postal system where they had chariots set up along uh, intervals along the Roman roads 
to deliver messages. Much like the United States Post Office, what up? And also post offices of other countries. So thank the Romans for your post. Thank the Egyptians for your letters. Thank the medieval Indian and Chinese civilizations for your dope ink. Hey. Letters are a worldwide endeavor and they're a huge part of human communication. They've been around for so long. It's kind of neat. Lead pencils actually did originate in ancient Greece too, which I think is super interesting. I didn't realize that. What? Crazy. Today's pencils are made using graphite cause some people chew on pencils and lead is super poisonous. <laughs> so go ahead, gnaw on those pencils, you busy beavers. So prior to 1840, this is jumping way ahead in history, peanuts. Prior to 1840, letters were delivered by a coach or by host, horse rider or just by a person walking really fast. However, in 1840, ooh, the receiver of the letter had to pay on its receipt and the cost is dependent on the number of pages and the distance traveled. Today, we usually charge by weight and there's kind of a standard set weight for letters. If you write someone a letter and it's like super T-H-I-C-C-C -C -C thick, like it's super thick, it's a fat letter, you're gonna need to go to the post office and pay a little bit more. But most standard letters just are a standard flat rate with stamps that I have clearly used. <laughs> um, in 1840, Queen Elizabeth, no, I'm so sorry. Woof, she wasn't around. The first one was dead and the second one wasn't born yet. In 1840, uh, Great Britain introduced the first prepaid stamp and Queen Victoria, the, uh, the stamp was actually a portrait of Queen Victoria. Maybe one day I'll get my face on a stamp. Hashtag goals. Anyway, the first stamp was a portrait of Queen Victoria and it was introduced in Great Britain in 1840 uh, for letters under half an ounce. Then it was still delivered via courier or post, but it was prepaid. So you didn't have to worry about the recipient not having enough money to pay for the letter. In the United States, the postal service was first introduced in August of 1842, and it's been going strong ever since. The United States post office is awesome. I like the post office because you can get letters there and packages and stuff. And when the internet goes down, it's a great way to communicate with people. <laughs> All right, so that is a very rushed, very garbled history of the letter. Again, I'm sure inaccuracies abound, but it comes from handwrittenletters.com and a couple other places that I did my research. Feel free to fact check me and yell at me about how I'm wrong. That's totally fine. In fact, I welcome it. But one other thing I found while I was looking up letter writing in general was this book from 1876, I think. Let me look. 1876, and it's called How to Write Letters by J. Willis Westlake. And it's Ponzi. I love it so much. Ponzi's not the word. I don't know what that word even means. It's it's a little snotty, but it's awesome. It's like a really cool instructional, instructional manual about letters. And what is interesting about it is even back in 1876, y'all, a minute ago, J. Willis Westlake complains, nearly all the writing of most persons is in the form of letters and yet in many of our schools, this kind of composition is almost entirely neglected. I don't think anyone has told J. Willis Westlake about the contemporary situation regarding letters and teaching letters, also texting. <gasps> Can you imagine J. Willis Westlake on a text? Dear Ms. Wheat, 
text finds you well. Yours truly, J. Willis Westlake. Okay, boomer. I love it. Anyway, J. Willis Westlake also says, Ugh. I don't know. I'll quote him later. He says a lot of stuff. It is very wordy text. You are lucky I am breaking it down for you, but <laughs> it's really kind of lovely. It talks all about how to write different kinds of letters. Today we're going to focus mostly on the casual letter, but it talks all about how to write different kinds of letters, how you should keep your sentences uh, short and sweet, but also very meaningful. And it says, it talks about how to find something to say and then how to say it. One of his quotes that I like a lot goes, invention is finding something to say. It is the most difficult part of composition as it is a purely intellectual process requiring originality, talent, judgment, and information. While expression is to some extent a matter of mechanical detail and subject to rules that can be easily understood and applied. A person can write out in weeks or months the work, a work the invention of which requires the thought and labor of many years. Yet both parts of composition are equally essential. It is certainly a noble thing to have great thoughts, but without the power of expressing them, the finest sentiments are unavailable. Basically, he's saying you gotta think of something to write, which can take a long time, and then you just gotta write it, which takes a lot less time. But both are really important, and both are fun to practice. I'll give you some suggestions for stuff to write about, and I'll give you some structure for how to write it. Give it a try! Write me a letter! Or write uh, a relative a letter, and I'll show you how to address one and send it in the post. Um, or if you want and you don't have access to stamps or fancy stationery or any paper or you don't have Julius Caesar with some pens, you can always write an email. Emails are awesome and your teachers will love it if you write your emails in the forms of letters. They just go nuts over that stuff. Don't ask me why, we just do. I think it's just something in the water that we drink. All right, so that's J. Willis Westlake. I'm going to use most of what he says to tell you guys how to write a letter. Let's go ahead and give it a try. Letters are often written to say thank you for things. In fact, one of these examples in the J. Willis Westlake book is a thank you letter for a birthday gift, which reads, How did you know what I wanted? Surely some good angel must have whispered the secret to you. However that may be, you exactly suited my taste, and I thank you with my whole heart. It's really sweet. In contrast, a text that I found that I sent my dad upon receiving a birthday present from him reads, Dude, saw it. Loved it. Love you. Thanks. Woof. I tried writing it out like a letter. And even if I pulled a SpongeBob and made it super fancy, I know the letters are backwards, chickens. But yeah, even if I make it really fancy, that's not a letter that I want to receive. And I don't think it's a letter my dad would want to receive either. <laughs> so following the guidelines of J. Willis, J. Willis, West Lake, West Brook, I don't even remember what his name is. I'm going to take plain, take pains, write as plainly and neatly as possible, rapidly if you can, slowly if you must. Good writing affects us sympathetically, giving us a higher appreciation both of what is written and of the person who wrote it. Now, I know my accent changed like a million times in that, but what he's saying is that it's important to maybe write a first draft of your letter and to write neatly and to write plainly, to express yourself clearly, but also to take your time writing something that will 
affect the other person in a really positive way or really affect their feelings. It's important. Letters are a really good way to express our feelings. There are many different kinds of letters, but these are three of the main ones. A love letter, a business letter, and a friendly letter. I'm going to write a friendly letter to my father. Most letters, pretty much all letters, start out with dear and then the recipient's name. I'm writing to my father, so I'm saying dearest pops. The date goes in the upper right hand corner and Generally, letters start out with like, a message for goodwill. Hope this letter finds you in good health and good spirits, where you say that you're excited about how the listener or the recipient is feeling. Then you can end your letter, you can end your letter with warmly, sincerely, or love, depending on the person you're sending the letter to. Since it's my father, I'm gonna use love. But if it was a business letter, I might say, sincerely, S-I-N-C-E-R-E-L-Y. Because it's more formal. If it's a friendly letter, or a love letter, or even a business letter, I can say, warmly. Because this just means, friendly goodwill. So warmly is how I usually sign most of my letters, but I love my dad. He's pretty great. He puts up with me. So I'm gonna end my letter for, to him with love. Oh, if I can keep my pen. Anyway, once I've written a letter, you can write a letter on anything, by the way. You can write it on a postcard, which I'll have a little place for you to put the address. Stamp goes here. Or you can write it on a fancy, fancy card. Back in the day, people used to write their letters on fancy stationery, which is just pretty paper, and then they would scent them with perfume, which I actually think is kind of rude because perfume makes me feel sick. I'm gonna stop with that accent because it's terrible, but you get the gist of it. Once you've written your letter, you need to address it. You put it in an envelope, and you put the address right in the middle. So I'm sending it to Ms. Weed's dad. You put the street and the number house that's on the street. I've made up this address. It's a combination of a bunch of different roads and a bunch of different cities and states. But what you'll do, number of the house, street name, then the city, the state, usually states in the Americas are abbreviated. So in the US of A, you'll put an abbreviation for a state. This happens to be the abbreviation for the state of Vermont. And then the zip code. A zip code is a five digit number that the post office uses to really pinpoint the address. You'll put your address right up at the top left. This top left address is called a return address. In case I mess this up, they can, or I didn't put enough stamps on it, they can send it back to me so I can try again. The stamp goes in the top right hand corner. As you know, the first stamped piece of mail was sent by Queen Victoria and the first stamp was Queen Victoria's face. This is not Queen Victoria. This is just a terrible drawing of an angry lady. Stamp. You can get stamps from the post office or you can order them online, I think. I don't really know. I got these stamps from my post office. They're space, Woo! As you can see, I like sending letters. You'll fold the letter up, pop it in the envelope. And most envelopes nowadays, you don't lick this part. You actually can just stick it on there and it'll stick. This envelope is old, so I'd probably have to lick it. But honestly, in the era of COVID-19, I think it's probably a bad idea to lick an envelope. So you can tape it shut or you can buy envelopes that stick closed on their own. They're easy to find. That's how to write a letter. That's how to address it. Ms. Weed doesn't know anything except for that thing. Fun fact, y'all. Historians love letters. They just love them, y'all. The <laughs> historians really do love letters. They're an amazing record of what happened throughout history. And we are incredibly sad when we can't find 
written record of various periods in history or from various voices in history. Being able to write has often been associated with power and status and wealth and control over other people. And it's sad because the people who weren't in power and weren't in control were not able to write. And so we don't have any records or we don't have many records of life for them. People suffering the under Roman rule or even slaves in the horrific time of American slavery. We don't have a lot of written records because writing has been often associated with power. So take the power back, kids. For real, try writing letters. Letters survive long after the internet and electricity has gone away in a kind of horrifying loss of power. No, letters are just really cool source documents for historians and they're easy to access and they're easy to look at. And there have been some very silly letters written throughout history. And this rat is going to tell me about them. Get ready for your close-up. Not camera ready, this rat. And now, a reading of some of the famous letters from history. Could you stop with your chewing? Could you? He is much bigger than me, so I'm just gonna read. <clears throat> Herman Melville wrote a letter to a friend slash possible love interest saying, your heart beats in my ribs and mine in yours, which is very, very sweet. I agree. In contrast, another person wrote a famous love letter that said, You make me feel safe. Like when Luke Skywalker carved out the body of his tauntaun and slept inside it to shelter him from the sub-zero temperatures of the ice planet Hoth. Mmm, maybe not. Maybe not. If you're trying to write a love letter to someone, maybe take a page from Melville's book and don't reference hollowing out a corpse. I would say so too. Me and the mouse agree. Rat? Mouse? IDK. Speaking of rats, Thomas Jefferson actually wrote a letter about rats as well, in which he said, Rats ate my pocketbook! which was sitting right next to my bed. However, I cannot blame the devil, cause you know rats will be rats. So basically, Thomas Jefferson invented the phrase, haters gonna hate, rats will be rats. <laughs> Finally, um, two, three final famous letters. One is from Abe Lincoln, who we know is supposed to be honest, Abe. But this one was a little too honest. One day, I got into a fit of musing in my room, and I stood resting my elbows on the bureau. Looking into the glass, it struck me what an ugly man I was. The fact grew on me, and I made up my mind that I must be the ugliest man in the world. Woof! A little too much honesty there, Abe. Also, hmm. We're all beautiful. Two final famous letters. Uh, the infamous Cuban dictator Fidel Castro actually wrote a letter when he was younger to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in which he had the audacity to ask the man for 10 bucks, which I think is amazing. He was basically just like, I've never seen 10 American dollars before. If you could send 10 American dollars to me, that would be awesome challenge for you. Write a sitting president or a leader of any country and ask them for 10 bucks. Don't ask me, I teach public school. The final letter was found in someone's car in North Dakota after it got broken into. Uh, this is a letter from the early 2000s, so it's the most recent of this collection. A man's car was broken into. This is a real letter, by the way. This is real. A man's car was broken into and some of his stuff was stolen. And the thief left a letter and it says, you have amazing taste in music. 
Don't worry about your credit cards and driver's licenses. I know I can't use them after tonight at least. Seriously though, lock your car in the future. <sighs> Having a good CD collection will not save you from getting robbed. So lock your darn car. Oh, geez. One of the other reasons that I'm encouraging you to try writing a letter is because letters can help you manage your feelings. In this time of quarantine, we can get on each other's nerves. We're all sort of stuck in a space together and it can lead to some hurt feelings and it can lead to some hurtful arguments and some hurtful words. So having a letter or writing a letter helps you sort out what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and it makes you kind of figure out whether you really want to say this to the other person or if it's something that you can just kind of let go. I'm gonna write a letter right now to Bjorn. Who does not care that when we were playing earlier, he bit me. I know he didn't mean to, but that doesn't matter. It was really hurtful and it literally hurt. It really hurt. Chole. That's a deep, deep reference. You may or may not get that, children. Anyway, this is where writing multiple drafts of a letter can really help. The first draft of my letter might read something like, Dear Idiot Bjorn, How bleep dare you, you stupid bleep! I hate you so much, you I can't believe that you bleep and bit my finger. You are a horrible, horrible dog, and I hope that you fall off a cliff and you die. You die because you are so rude. I am so tired of having to do so much for you. <laughs> and maybe those expletives, that mood, maybe that's how I'm feeling. I write it all down. And then... I read over it. I gotta think about two things. One, the tone of this letter is very aggressive. Do I need it to be that aggressive? Probably not. That's probably gonna ruin my relationship with the individual that I'm stuck with for the foreseeable future. Then I gotta think about it like, would I want to receive a letter like that? I love letters. If I were to open up my mailbox and if I were to open up the post and get a letter with that in it, that would really suck. So now I'm going to try to rewrite the letter using the fanciest words that I can possibly think of. And I'm going to use the internet to help me. And also maybe Michael. I used the internet and a thesaurus to help me find some fancy words. I looked up words for angry, rude, gross, uh, and smelly. And now my letter looks something like this. Dearest Bjorn, at the time of this writing, I find myself sorely vexed by your impertinent behavior, you impudent wastrel. Wastrel? I don't know how to say that word. I only read it. I find your churlish cavalier disregard for my bones tragic and heart-wrenching. And it has taken all my strength not to turn you into a hat, you noxious mongrel. Sincerely, Ms. Weed. And that served two purposes. One, I learned some great new words. Two, writing it in that formal, silly fashion kind of let me cool my feelings down a little bit. And it took me away from how angry and irritated I am with my dog. Then I realized Bjorn doesn't have access to a thesaurus. So I thought back to our book writer, our letter writer guide from 1876, who said that it should be expressed clearly and simply and briefly. 
So I wrote my final letter, which reads, Dear Bjorn, when you bit me earlier today, I found it difficult to contain my feelings of anger and sorrow. I try to do a lot for you, and I feel like you don't appreciate that. I understand that you get really excited when we play, and sometimes you can't contain that excitement. So then you do things like bite my finger, which honestly hurts me a lot more than I think that it would have hurt you had you bit your own tongue. It bled a lot, and it was gross. I'm sad about it. I want you to know that I'd like it if we try to cool down our playtime a little bit, because I think it would be really beneficial for both of us in the future. That way, you can have fun and I can have fun and no one can get hurt. Sincerely, Ms. Weed. Then I realized that not only does Bjorn not have access to a thesaurus, he's a dog and he doesn't speak English. Quarantine is melting my brain. <laughs> but if Bjorn was a person who had hurt my feelings, or just done something really dumb that made me angry, writing a letter still would have helped. Because after I read that letter, I realized, you know what? He didn't mean it. It was an accident. He's a jerk, as you can see there for how he's treating his brother. He's a bit of a jerk, but he means well, mostly. He just wanted to play. So, I can let that feeling go. I can let that letter go. Darling, darling little love chickens, my sweet, dear little chickpeas, my darling cats of quarantine. Letter writing can be helpful, not just to send somebody something that they'll love and cherish and hold on to, something that they can write back to you and they can send a letter back to, and you can have something that you'll love and cherish and hold on to. But it can also help you manage your feelings. And it's really important that now more than ever, <laughs> hello, Rookie's Tail. Now more than ever, it's really important that we think about how we're feeling and how we want to express those feelings. And maybe we don't say the first thing that comes to our mind, maybe we write it down and then we write a second draft and then we decide, do we need to say that? Do we need to give them that letter? Or can we let it go? So letter writing has a lot of different purposes. They can be funny, they can be sad, they can express feelings, they can help you manage your own feelings, and bonus, they're an amazing piece of historical record. They also make the people who receive them feel really, really loved. So think of somebody in your life you could write a letter to. Maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's me! <laughs> and go ahead and write that letter. Make sure, if you want to send them that letter via post, make sure that on your addressed, uh, on your addressed envelope, you put a stamp. These stamps are forever stamps and they're space. I love space. You'll put the stamp right here at the top, if it's facing you, top right corner of the letter. Boop, boop, boop. Stamp your address and the address of the person you're writing to. Yay! Letter writing. If you don't have stamps, if you don't have paper, if you don't have an envelope to send it in, that's okay. Try writing an email. Write an email to someone you miss or write an email to one of your teachers just for practice. They will love it. Like I've said, teachers love that sort of thing. I don't know why. Science can't explain it, but we love it when you write us letters that start with Dear Ms. Weed and end with Sincerely, your name and have complete sentences. <gasps> Crazy! <laughs> this has been a Ms. Weed Doesn't Know Anything production. This has been Bjorn. 
being bored in the back and Roki. We're all just trying our best over here. I hope you're doing, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're taking care of yourselves. I hope you are getting enough sleep, washing your hands and trying to contain and manage your boredom and contain and manage your feelings. Cause I know times can get a little frustrating. I hope maybe that you use this to help you. If not, you could always build a model of Julius Caesar out of gum and then just stab it with some pencils. I haven't done that. <laughs> Definitely not. Do you guys need conflict resolution? Do you want to try writing each other a letter? Yeah. Oh, oh, we were so close. We were so close. 